Si Jacobs, good to have you back in the studio. Man, you were a big hit at the conference. Thank you, Alec. It was quite enjoyable being there. So thank you for inviting me. And you're coming to the next one. And I've committed now to Fabulous. come to the other. Fabulous. Well, you got a big fan club. A lot of people at the Biz News Conference came to me afterwards and said, well, yeah, how did you manage to get Sai here? Um, I'm so glad he's done so well for me over the years. But uh, it, I wasn't surprised because you, you guys have been around 361 been around since 2004. You started it with Stephen Litz, Lisp? Lips. Lips. How did the two of you meet? Yeah, so we met, interestingly enough, during articles uh, at Kessel Feinstein, which is now Grant Thornton. Uh, we later moved to Simpson McKee because we both love markets. We realized we love markets even during articles. In fact, we were more involved in markets probably than in articles. Uh, and then we moved to Simpson McKee and Simpson McKee was later bought by HSBC. And a couple of years after that, we did a deal to sell the business that we worked in to Investec for five and a half years. Both myself and Steve were part of that team. And when our restraints came to an end in 2004, we oh. left the two of us to form 361. So you guys have been together as a partnership for a long time. A long time. We met in the mid 1990s. So. Is he also involved in the investment side? He was initially involved in the investment side, but once we formed our business, and in fact, earlier than our business, at Investec, he became the chief operating officer of Investec Securities. So once we started our business, he handled everything outside of the investment uh, arena. So full operations, compliance, et cetera, and I handled the investment so side. So you drew the long straw. I do the, <laughs> I do the so, slightly more difficult straw, the more uh, volatile straw. The more interesting straw. Maybe, possibly. Why did you decide right from the outset to not be another boutique asset manager that would do what is called long-only funds? In other words, unit trusts, things that yeah. most people know about, but to, to go into hedge funds as well. Yeah, so we, I always had a big interest in hedge funds. So even at our time at Investec, I tried to launch a hedge fund and I was pushed back on it. And it's interesting that after we left, they then decided to copy us and also launch a hedge fund. Mm. I think seeing how well it had taken off uh, and how quickly it, how well it was doing. Um, but I always had an interest in shorting. So I loved shorting? the idea. I loved the idea what of finding, shorting? I loved the idea of finding companies that weren't going to go up, that maybe something was wrong with or were overvalued. And effectively, you could borrow someone else's shares. You could sell that share and hopefully buy it back at a lower price and effectively make profits on a declining share price. So you've just explained what shorting is. Correct. And that's a very big part of financial markets internationally, specifically in the United States. But in South Africa, not fully understood. Yeah, well, the hedge fund industry itself is very small in South Africa. So as a percentage of our total, you know, unit trust industry, it's tiny. You know, you're talking 30, 40 billion rand compared to a couple of trillion. It's not, uh, it's not a big part of the market. There are a lot of international hedge funds that obviously trade in South Africa. They're our main competitors in the South African mm. market. Um, but it's a, a very good market to trade shorts in. There's plenty borrow, lots of prime brokers who are able to give you script. And um, it's been good, as you know, the likes of Steinhoff and African Bank and EOH and many companies over the years that have, you know, not Those delivered. are three that yeah. you guys hit. Yeah. Hard. Hard. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, there've been plenty others that have been too expensive or relative opportunities, you know, there may be some that are, are very good businesses, but in fact are overvalued to something else in the same industry. So you have, you're able to play the one off the other in that case. You're not taking any market risk. You can short the one and with the money buy the other one. And effectively, even if they both collapse, you don't lose any money. But if the one outperforms the other one, you're able to still make a good return without risking any capital. The only problem with that is if you get your story wrong. Let's just say, for instance, that you had shorted Steinhoff and you can tell us whether you did. And they managed to somehow keep the fraud going and keep it going Almost well, indefinitely. That's exactly what did happen. So I think I told you the story once, and I, I, I'll repeat myself, and I'm sure many, many listeners haven't heard it. But in 2009, we were short JD Group. In fact, we were looking for JD Group to, in fact, uh, 
you know, not go belly up necessarily, but we believed the performance was deteriorating significantly. And we'd seen the same thing happen with Protea furnishes, which basically went to the wall. And we believed JD was headed the same way. We were short. And Steinhoff, just before results in 2009, bought a controlling stake of JD Group. Results came out, and the results were magnificently good, up 40%. I remember some of the intricate differences. They capitalized their IT costs. They changed the method of provisioning for debtors, etc. And I was the auditor, actually, at Kessel Feinstein on the JD Group and the Protea Furnishes Audit. So I knew those businesses quite well, and I smelt immediately something was wrong. I, in fact, met Marcus on the day of those JD Group results for the first time ever. I confronted him, and I told him that these are not true results. Marcus Eurster. I told Marcus Eurster. That was brave. And I actually, at the time, was so naive (laughs) that I believed that potentially the CEO at the time, time, David Sussman, had in fact maybe pulled one over Marcus. Little did I know that after that, you know, my name tag was obviously memorized quite carefully by Marcus. I came from 361. And after that, our relationship started souring slowly with, with Steinhoff. You're not getting invited to various company functions, etc. Uh, we were always talked about um, not in a good light with various brokers on his behalf. Um, and another very interesting story happened actually at that same time. Um, a certain lady who was a very good analyst wrote an interesting report about JD Group and the fact that these numbers were also very much fictitious. Independent of you. Independent of us who worked for a big bank. And that report came out and I thought, wow, that's what a great report. One of the first true brilliant reports that I've seen calling a stock worth maybe 20% of its share price. The following day, that report was retracted by the institution. Ouch. Ouch. And obviously Marcus had caused that. And that person who actually eventually left that bank and landed up working for another bank uh, was never really allowed to tell her story, which would have been a good little (laughs) extra bit to put on the Steinhaus show, actually. It would have been a fantastic bit. In fact, you should have been on the Steinhaus show because uh, JP, uh, um, who was quite well featured on that, uh, worked for you at the time that he was doing the shorting. Correct. So did you guys share notes? Yes, no, absolutely. So JP was very much part of our team. Uh, He believed, like I believed, that there were serious issues with Steinhoff. Uh, We were short, in fact, as early as 2009 and 10. Um, And then the interesting thing that happened, Evan Walker joined our team. Evan came from RMB, and he actually spoke us out of the short, saying, Not that anything necessarily we were saying was wrong, but just that the support that Marcus had, the support of all the big institutions. And us at 361, we weren't going to win this war in in the short to medium term. Mm. So luckily over the next eight years, there were probably many times we weren't short and many times we were slightly short. Um, And Evan actually owned some and did well out of it actually. Uh, in in the time up to up to 2017, um, and interesting enough, when it did eventually break, we were slightly short. But overall, we never made money out of that short, uh, which is really frustrating. We had the knowledge, we had the facts, uh, but if you aggregate the whole time period, it wasn't a profit. Jean Pierre Fester learned his trade with you. Does he also? I know he's now on his own. Does he also still? Operate a hedge fund? Absolutely, yeah. So, so he, has so his he own knew hedge fund. he had an option. So yes, and, yes. So hedge funds are, for those who've been involved in them, sound a heck of a lot more exciting, uh, but also maybe more dangerous than, yeah. than just long onlys. Look, I, I think from, from our point of view, and we, ran, we run everything. So we run long onlys, both South Africa and South Africa and offshore. We have balanced funds and we have hedge funds. Our hedge funds are our lower, lowest risk option. Oh. Lowest risk option because the way we run our, net, our hedge funds is the net equity exposure we have, in other words, how much equity we have in our portfolio, runs at between, say, 20 and 50%, where a long-only fund will obviously be 100%, a balanced fund may be 60 or 70 So we actually have net exposure of a lot lower. We have the ability to short. We have the ability to buy structures to kind of protect the capital. 
and you can look at it in in bad markets and you can see that our hedge fund in bad markets has performed better than any other type of asset class that's available to investors so we're not down this year we're up uh you know so you in, just say that again we're not down <laughs> we're up <laughs> and we came off a very good year last year you know we made we, we actually ex- beat the market last year yeah. by making 26 odd percent and we're up and not a big number and five six seven percent this year but it's up in a very negative market. Well, the reason we're up mm. is because we've had good shorts. Yeah. If you've just preserved your capital Correct. this year, one of the worst years on record, then you've done extraordinarily well. So is it is a hedge fund also a good place to have money in an up cycle? Let's just say that this bear that we see over here is going to be turned over and the bull is going to take over again. Uh, at that point in time, would the hedge fund then underperform? Is it you probably find as the market turns, there may be an element of underperformance, especially if we haven't predicted it. But if we predicted it and we maybe get the cycle right, then we're going to up our net exposure for good markets. We're going to lessen our shorts. Um, and we're probably never going to do as well as the market in a very strong bull run. But actually there have been times like last year in 2021 when the markets were very strong, we actually even managed to beat the market. And we beat the market on only 50% net exposure, which means that the calls we made were so much better than the market. And obviously the shorts we had at the time never went up that much. So there are times though, in a very big strong market where a hedge fund will underperform. And you can expect that. But when you aggregate the two together, and we look at our history of 16 years, you land up with a very different outcome to the market. So it's it's all about compound annual growth rate, uh, protecting that rather than maybe having 50% up in one Correct. year and then 30% down the next. Correct. So it, it's someone who came to you right in the beginning, 2004, and invested 1,000 Rand or 100,000 Rand, make it more realistic. What would that have been worth? Yeah, so they would have approximately 12 times their money, 12 times their money wasn't from 2004, 12 times from when we launched the hedge fund, which was in late 2000, mid 2006. So in 16 odd years, you've made 12 times your capital back. And in 2016, you opened this to the retail market. Correct. Uh, just explain what happened there, because yes, the so first hedge fund, presumably you needed a lot of money to participate. Oh, you, you, you did at the time. So the, the way the legislation worked at the time, it, you had to be a selected investor. Marketing wasn't permitted for hedge funds. They weren't included under the Collective Investment Scheme, Schemes Act, etc. So that all changed in 2016. So 2016, you could register your hedge fund as a normal unit trust. And so we have that today, a normal hedge fund unit trust. It is exactly the same as our hedge fund that started in 2006. They run pari passu to all extent and purposes. The only difference Mm -hmm. is the first hedge fund is only dealt on a monthly basis. So you can only put money in at the end of a month or draw money out on a calendar month's notice where the unit trust has to abide by unit trust laws, which is daily. So there are daily flows. Anyone can put money into our retail hedge fund on any day and take money out on any day, just like they can in any other fund in the country. And they replicate or do they mirror each other? They mirror each other. Each other okay. Yes. Tell us about those good calls last year and just so that we can understand how a hedge fund can perhaps do better than a, than a unit trust. Right. So I think, I think for us, uh, very much, you know, coming into COVID in the t- in 2020 era, let me go back to that era, we saw COVID coming. So we, we very much defended the fund and we realised that governments would obviously try and stimulate, re-stimulate again at a time where maybe we shouldn't have been stimulating. There was already, uh, we felt we were really nearing that end of that bull market and things were deteriorating. But we threw helicopter, or the world threw helicopter money at the problem and we realized rates were tending close to zero. So we bought very much long duration tech assets in the 2020 and we'd sold a lot and been short a lot of South African businesses we thought were going to struggle. The banks, for example, uh, you know, we were short and, the, and they did work out phenomenally well. So the likes of an Absin and Nedbank lost you know, 50, 60% of their value. We were short, we made money. And the likes of Naspas, Process and many 
international technology stocks, Microsoft, Apple, Google, we were long, did very, very well. Then in 2021, uh, we realized we were starting to come out of COVID. And in fact, the reverse was starting to become the story. Rates could rise, inflation was becoming a hot topic already. And we realized what was going to probably happen is these long duration tech assets were in fact going to be shorts. So from about the middle of 2021, till even now, we've been short a lot of the technology stocks, uh, specifically in, in the US. Not only your high quality ones, but a lot of the low quality companies that listed over the last few years. I don't know how many business models you know, like Kavana or Wayfair, Beyond Meat, uh, Peloton. You know, Peloton, you know. So those were in our mind almost a once in a, in a lifetime type of opportunity. Probably should have done more in hindsight, but that generated a lot of profit in the later part of 2021 and now in 2022 as well. And the likes of going from short to long on South African banks, um, you know, buying the, the ABSA's exact 80 and 70 and now they're 190, uh, delivered us very good returns and on a, only on a small amount of capital. So the whole time in the hedge fund over the last two and a half years, we've never had more than 40% of the fund really invested in equities. So it's been with very little risk, but yet we've totally out, outperformed the market. So had it, that's an interesting point, because had it taken longer for your view to be manifest, because you didn't have, you hadn't bet the farm, Correct. you, you could actually hold out for that. Correct, correct. And small little options. We also do, don't want to get too complicated here, but we, we bought various options on like the NASDAQ out the money. So what that meant was when we did start seeing the turn and the NASDAQ has come off 30 something percent this year, we had different levels that we were effectively paying premium away to make four or five times our premium if the market breached certain levels. And that's contributed quite nicely to the profit this year. So how long do you give yourself to get your view to work out? Let's just say we take today and for argument's sake, you, you believe today the US market, you don't, but if you did believe the US market has bottomed and it's going to go up again quickly, how long would you risk capital given that you, and you risk a, 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 only a portion of it until that view so for, for us, specifically in the hedge fund, it's about absolute performance. Not only absolute performance longer term, but absolute performance even in the short to medium term. So being in an asset, for example, now that we're not sure has necessarily bottomed, we, we may not do. But where we've got a big margin of safety, for example, the multiple's very low and the growth rate is decent and the dividend yield is high, then we're happy to buy it and sit on it and wait. So... That's why right now, you know, we don't think, for example, the NASDAQ or the S&P is necessarily bottomed. We haven't seen third quarter earnings yet in a big way. Uh, we saw some nice earnings. Well, not earnings. We saw nice subscriber numbers from Netflix last night. Tonight will be the most interesting one because the Tesla numbers mm. come out tonight. It'll be very interesting to see that number. But I think for us, third quarter earnings in the US is more important. But we're only really going to sit on big long-term, long opportunities that are cheap, giving us a good dividend, and we know that the growth rates are there. Otherwise, for now, we're actually find, finding alternative instruments to buy. We've more recently, with the blowout in, in rates, particularly offshore, have found US-denominated corporate debt at very good rates. And in fact, a lot of that debt belongs to SA banks and industrial companies. So. You can buy, for example, ABSA 2026 dollar denominated corporate debt at over 11% per annum. Uh, if you know where to look. If you know where to look, <laughs> you know, and uh, I think Bidvest at close to nine and First Rand at 10. So for us, locking some money in, in that in the short to medium term just is a lot safer than trying to call the bottom of the market and, you know, We'd rather be a bit late even to the start of the cycle. I think, you know, knowing that maybe the Fed has now given up on the war against inflation or inflation has come down, 
and they've made the appropriate change to the interest rate outlook and started potentially talking about cuts. Because until that happens, you know, I don't, I'm not sure markets are headed in any any long term bull run for now. I, I, it, it sounds to me like it's not difficult for you to get out of bed in the morning. Because it's all changing so, and it's all exciting. It's, it's, yeah. it's always exciting. Yeah. And in fact, you know, I look forward to nine o'clock in the morning when the market opens. Mm. So I like to see what's happening. And it, years gone by, I used to get sad at five o'clock. But now we've got the US markets open for a lot longer. And given the fact that we can invest a lot bigger chunk offshore and we forever expanding our horizons offshore, uh, that's become actually far more exciting for me than the local SA market. So the investable universe has expanded. Yeah. Okay, just, just for the last part of this interview, help us out here. How is uh, Sa Jacobs and 361, your team, how are you thinking? How are you looking at things today? So I think we're still very nervous and we're in a protectionist mindset. So for us, capital preservation is key. So if you look in our long only strategies, and they've also done very well versus the benchmarks, you know, we're in, we're in sectors where we think equities are the cheapest. We still like commodities. We like certain commodity stocks, but we want to have the ones where the free cash flow yields are the highest. Okay? We don't think commodity companies have invested enough over the past decade, so we're, we think they're going to remain higher for longer. So we like that strategy, and we think there's a lot of defensiveness in that. In other words, there's not going to be a lot of new players no. coming in there. So if you're in the game already, yeah. isn't that a bit like South Africa Inc., if you think of it? It, it is. And, and South Africa Inc. even got more like that, I think, during COVID, where a lot more independence fell over. The big SA Inc. were able to renegotiate lower cost structures, leases, re-engineer their businesses. So I think actually SA Inc. also looks you know, reasonably good. And you've also got a big safety of margin in valuation. So would, would, where would you be, uh, when you say SA Inc., would it be the Roynet, ACR, Tiger Brands? Probably um, be more the banks. So the um, banks, I think, have still got double-digit type returns from potentially the excessive provisioning that happened during COVID and the fact that many of them have actually streamlined their businesses a lot, closing branches, bringing in the cost structure, renegotiating leases as well. And if you look at the ROEs, et cetera, they look decent and the multiples are low. I mean, Epson, Nedbank are probably on a sub seven forward multiple, 8% dividend yields with growth. So I think there's a- That's there's almost a, better than putting your money with them in a, in a savings account. A, absolutely. It is definitely better than putting a savings <laughs> account. So banks, good. And no bank charges. And no bank, indeed. Uh, SA Inc. Uh, appealing yeah. uh, because of that comp competitive or the lack of com global competition. Yeah. What about international markets? Uh, talking to Sean Pesh, who you uh, met at um, the Business Conference, he says, if you can't buy Europe now at these prices, you're never going to buy it. Are you nervous there as well? Though? We're still nervous on Europe. I think it hasn't necessarily bottomed. Uh, we saw what happened in the UK, pension with pension funds. Um, I think the, the Europe is in a mess. They, you know, it will take them a while to fix it. We've seen, we've seen good movements like on behalf of Germany. Uh, if you look at how much they've done with, with uh, their power utilities and how much action they've taken versus our Eskom, it's, it's quite sad. Um, you know, and look at the ingenuity that they, they, they're using in a quick space of time. But it's going to take several years to plug that unless we get a turnaround on the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. You know, I don't think Europe is almost is almost uninvestable still for a while. China, sure. Anyone's guess. I mean, you've got the national conference at the moment. The rhetoric coming out of it on COVID doesn't seem to be changing. So the zero policy is absolutely absurd. Um, secondly, the positive, I suppose, in the conference is we haven't heard more on regulations. So hopefully the regulations behind us. <coughs> But growth has faltered. Property, property prices coming off, too much leverage in the sector and um, in the country overall. And I, I think it's going to be tough there. But again, we've seen markets come off you know, 70% there. So mm. there must come a time where, you know, maybe into next year where things start looking cheap.
So to close off with here in South Africa, politics is so important in the context here. How much time do you, or how much attention do you pay to that? Probably not enough. Um, we're more hopeful than, uh, <laughs> than maybe, <coughs> maybe uh, to say anything. That we, and we do hope that obviously in our future years in South Africa, I mean, I'm a South African bull, so I do, I, but I am optimistic or am realistic in knowing that in the short to medium term, we probably have to go through probably more pain. We'd like to see the ANC obviously lose control, but that also creates potential chaos. Um, in the shorter to medium term because there's no real party to take up the reins and the coalitions could be dangerous rather than than good. Um, but we're off such a low base and the potential in South Africa is so good. I mean, if you're sitting in the UK right now and your winter is arriving and you've got no gas and you potentially can't afford where you're at and you look down in the southern tip of Africa and you see you could buy a magnificent property for almost a couple hundred thousand pounds and yes okay you'd have to have a generator and a water backup or whatever solar etc you could live a phenomenal life here so i think we haven't done a great job in marketing it uh, and we in, in truth i don't know if we're any less safe than you are for example today in some of these major cities like the uk and in many areas in south africa you can go so I think we're, we're coming off such a low base that there is a potential of just a few things eventually get sorted, uh, that we could be in for, for good times here, but that could be a way off. So you're bull on South Africa, not, not short of South Africa? I'm not short South Africa. And valuations in South Africa are, are ridiculously cheap on a, on a relative basis to develop markets. So if you look at the equity space, it's cheap. So you can't be too negative. So even if you're a really conservative investor, even if you're a guy who has just cashed in your pension, uh, you, you're not going to be earning much income in the next 10, 20 years, last 20 years of your life, would you then still be invested in South African equities? I would, but for right now, I'd rather, like I said, go buy these dollar-denominated bonds and get yourself 10% a year in dollars, you know, plus. And they are... They are tradable. So. And that's why people come to you and invest in hedge funds because you do look at things that are different that the average retail investor has got no way of understanding. And even if they knew where it was, Correct. how would they invest in it? Are you seeing, though, that retail investors are starting to understand or invest more with hedge funds? Or Absolutely. Is it, is Absolutely. It, so mm -hmm. we, we, had, we, had, uh, we have two retail hedge funds. And in fact, the inflows into the one were so quick we had to close it to new inflows. Um, Why did you was, do that? It was a different strategy. It wasn't our main hedge fund strategy, which is more longer term focused. It was a trading strategy, mm -hmm. a market neutral trading strategy, and it got to a, a number we one and a half billion pretty quickly. We had to shut it. Um, but in the retail normal hedge fund, which we launched in six, 2016, we are starting to see a lot of flows. It's available now on all the major platforms and we see daily flows into it and it is picking up and there is a big interest from particularly advisors because they're seeing how difficult it is to get a return in the current market. So, so the more sophisticated financial advisor uh, would be looking across the, the options and, and realizing that hedge funds are a good uh, vehicle. But as far as the the retail market is concerned, the guys who like to do it yourself investing, how do you reach them? How do you market to so them? So we don't really market to them. It's word of mouth. It's potentially them looking up returns in newspapers or surveys, uh, you know, following different unit trust returns, um, and ultimately maybe shows like yours give them give them some awareness of our funds. I mean, we, we do take direct clients as well. Retail clients come directly to us. We have probably, I don't know, a thousand plus direct retail clients who invest in our hedge funds with us. Um, and I suppose the people, word of mouth, good performance gets them involved. And the barrier to entry? What? No, there, oh, there's, there's really nothing. It's like a normal unit trust. It can put a monthly debit order, I think a few thousand rand. It's a, a very minimal amount in the hedge funds. Sa Jacobs, co-founder of 361, and I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com.